Let me ask you a question. Data journalism and data visualization, are they new, like since the internet era, since computers? No and no. So we've all spent a couple of years closely watching the coronavirus, right? The number of cases, the spread, the mortality rate, new variants. What if I told you the same thing happened? People paying close attention to an outbreak, journalists using data, 170 years ago. There was a case in 1849 in New York, the New York Tribune, where some reporters thought there might be a cholera outbreak. And cholera is a nasty infection of the intestine. They definitely wanted to know about it. And there had been some history. There was a global outbreak in the 1830s. New York being a port city had seen some cases of that. So if you thought there was some kind of disease outbreak, what do you think you'd do? You'd go find an expert to talk to and you'd look for some data. They went and found an expert, Professor William Gillespie at Union College in New York. And he was a math prof, by the way, but he also kept trend numbers in a log. And that led to this. In the fall of 1849, a clear spike from a couple hundred cases in May to more than a thousand in July. No deaths in May to more than 700 deaths in July. Basically, the whole story told in one chart. And actually, that New York Tribune story on the cholera outbreak in 1849, it wasn't even the first data journalism. The Guardian in London actually reported on student enrollment and the cost of education in England using data in 1821, and they visualized it in their newspaper. Some things about data journalism are new. So the internet has matured and there's a lot more data available and it's more prevalently available. So we get more data available and more visualizations. Let me ask you about that concept of more data. I bet some of you have a one terabyte hard drive, right? That's a lot of data, a terabyte. It's a thousand gigabytes, maybe even a two terabyte hard drive. So you think that's a bunch of data, but let me put it in perspective. Imagine a thousand terabytes. That equals one petabyte. Now imagine a thousand petabytes. That's one exabyte. So an exabyte is one billion megabytes. That's a crap load of data, right? The reason I'm walking you through all this is you'll be able to appreciate the biggest difference in data now compared to a decade ago, and it's this. That number comes from the Tau Center for Journalism in Columbia University in New York. We, all of us with our online habits, our movements using our cell phone, dancing in and out of apps, writing things, consuming things online, all of us together generate two and a half exabytes of data. That's 2.5 billion megabytes of data every day. So that's the main reason for this module. A lot more data is being generated regularly, daily, and a lot more data is publicly available. And more data and more data available means more opportunities for you. And that's what we're going to talk about. Here's a quote from Woody Claude Flowers. He's the founder of the first robotics competition. Nobody will pay you to know the data, but people will line up to pay you to do something creative with the data. And that's what we'll be doing in this module. We're going to show you how to get data and then how to do something creative with it. So again, this is a look at discrete data, and this is pretty generally available all over the country. You can do this in most, uh, most counties in the country. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go search the Bayer County Appraisal District. This is the, uh, the taxing authority in San Antonio, Texas, which is just south of San Marcos. And I can click on, click on Bear County Appraisal District, and then I'm going to select Property Search. And again, you can do this in thousands of counties around the country. Uh, there's a neat neighborhood there called Alamo Heights, and there's a road called Alamo Heights Boulevard. So I'm going to go search uh, Alamo Heights Boulevard, and then we'll see what houses come up. And what I'm looking for is just a couple of things that I can compare one against the other. So what it shows is these are the addresses, the owners. Over here are the prices. You can click on the map, the details. So let me just look and see if I see any patterns. Uh, uh, this is kind of interesting. So here's a 600 block Alamo Heights Boulevard. It's worth $600,000. Here's a house in the 600 block of Alamo Heights Boulevard that's worth $800,000. These two houses, 600,000, 800,000, are just up the road from each other. So what I'm gonna do is in a couple of new tabs, open view details, and we'll go see what the deal is, why the Cassia's house is worth a lot more than the uh, Bousquier's house. So let me start over here. This is uh, the Bousquier house. And so it's, if I go to improvement building, it'll show me 2,700 square feet built in 1942. Let's jump over here and do the same thing. Improvement building, 2,300 square feet. So this house is smaller and yet appraised higher. If you look over here, the smaller house is the Cassia, $795,000. So how come that house costs more? 
Well, if you go down in improvements, you can see they've added on a section of living room. They've added on another living area section. This house added a swimming pool. They've got a, uh, a patio, an elaborate patio that they built in back. They added a separate porch with a cover on it. So this house has had a number of improvements since the 1970s. And that's why that house is appraised higher than one just up the road by a couple hundred thousand dollars. And so that's what you can do with discrete data. Again, we'll spend most of our time in this class working with aggregate data, which is a whole lot of cases aggregated together to let you tell about trends, patterns, make predictions, that sort of thing. You can use aggregate data to tell individual stories. A bunch of news outlets do a great job taking aggregate data and turning it into what we call the user experience. They take that data and they arrange it so that you can tell your own story. And your story may be different from my story. We might approach data and a data interactive in different ways and be interested in some different things. And that's an important part of involving you, engaging you in telling your own story. Let me show you some examples. ProPublica does a great job with this. They have a whole investigative section on the opioid epidemic, and it's essentially focused on where the drugs come from. They built a multi-year database that shows which company produced the drugs, and which doctors are most likely to distribute them, which doctors benefit, profit the most from these interactions with the pharmaceutical companies. It's this brilliant, searchable interactive that allows for personalizing the story. Ohio's kind of ground zero for this epidemic, and that's my home state. So let me check there and sort by dollar amount. Dr. Lawrence Lynn actually earns royalties on the delivery mechanism for these drugs, but Adolf Lombardi, he just prescribes opioids to his patients. Look, seven million bucks over three years. California must have the highest paid prescriber of opioids, don't you think? Let's take a look. It's close. Dr. Narayan is an investor in a couple of pharmaceutical companies. Dr. Ella Trash earns royalties for helping develop and test some of the drugs. Still, that's a lot of money in three years. And right here in Texas, one orthopedic surgeon just down the road from us in San Antonio, he gets royalties, more than $20 million from just two companies who sell opioid medications, and over $60 million total in three years. 